All right, this is our reading concerning stage three of our exploration of perspectives on agriculture. Uh, we're now talking about towers, villages, and houses in the early Neolithic. And so stage three is the early New Stone Age. Uh, the early Neolithic is divided into two major periods, the pre-pottery Neolithic A, which dates between 12,000 and 10. 1,800 years ago, and the pre-pottery Neolithic B, which dates between 10,800 years ago and 8,500 years ago. The beginning of the pre-pottery -pottery Neolithic A corresponds with the end of the Younger Dryas event, while the pre-pottery Neolithic B corresponds to a period of improved climate. Considering the technology for archaeologists, the major marker that distinguishes the early Neolithic from the Natufian uh, tool industry is a gradual shift away from tools made on bladelets to a toolkit made on blades with a particular emphasis on arrowheads. And so, you can see Neolithic arrowheads um, all across the globe and uh, museums. By the pre-pottery Neolithic B, of course, arrowheads were made on skillfully manufactured blades. Blades are also used for sickles, as is indicated by the frequent presence of sickle polish. But ground stone axes and tools with a beveled edge, uh, so, uh, such knives, uh, also have uh, blade bevels as well, um, which are suitable for working wood or clearing trees, and that is pertinent in regard to the addition to the ne early Neolithic toolkit. Grinding stones used for processing grain are also found in extremely large quantities on early Neolithic sites. The use of plaster is also highly developed during pre-pottery Neolithic B and that period. Uh, the manufacturing plaster involves burning large quantities of limestone. Plaster was used indeed to line the floors of some houses and for a ritual purpose that will be described later. In some cases, plaster was used to build simple basins and bowls, uh, probably for carrying water or food. Concerning settlements during the pre-pottery Neolithic A, the size of settlements increased and the first evidence of communal structures are appearing. Houses continue to be circular, but settlements were larger than the Natufian ones. At the site of Natif Hagdud in the Jordan Valley, in, uh, and uh, of course there are Neolithic airheads uh, found in Nahal Hamar in Israel as well, uh, the remains of at least three houses were found in an excavation covering 500 square meters, less than 10% of the total area of the settlement. And of course this is Natif Hagdud a pre-pottery Neolithic A site in the Jordan Valley. That was a village of between 20 and 30 houses. Although population sizes are difficult to estimate, it seems likely that Nativ Hagdud housed somewhere between 20 and 30 families. And beyond the size of the settlement, there are other contrasts between Nativ Hagdud and large Natufian sites, such as Maala, which is a rapid accumulation of sediments on early Neolithic sites, and this points to the extensive use of mud brick architecture. At Nativ Hagdud, there was a buildup of close to 4 meters of sediment over a period of 200 to 300 years. The floors of the structures on the early Neolithic sites are well preserved and maintained. The debris tends to be concentrated in refuse pits, of course, shortage pits where are rare on Natufian sites are common at Nativ Hagdud and early Neolithic sites as well. The appearance of communal structures is the most striking aspect of the pre-pottery Neolithic A. The most spectacular of these structures is the tower discovered in the pre-pottery Neolithic A levels at Jericho. The 9-meter-high tower is made of undressed stones and mud brick and is attached to the inside of a massive wall. A staircase built inside the tower runs from the base to a hole in the flat platform at the top. And so the Jericho Tower is the earliest known large-scale piece of architecture in the Middle East, and it dates to the early Neolithic, and specifically um, 
It's a structure made of undressed stone and mud brick, and it dates to the pre-pottery Neolithic A. Estimates for the time that it was taken to build the tower and the attached wall range between 10,000 and 15,000 working days. Of course, Kenyon in 1981 interpreted the tower as part of a defensive wall, which she thought ran around the Neolithic village. Because only a small portion of the Neolithic site was excavated, there is no way, however, of knowing whether the bit of wall found attached to the tower does, in fact, run around the site. But in any case, it seems extremely unlikely that the tower would have served a military purpose, as it is built on the inside of the wall. And so the interpretation of the tower is made more difficult by the fact that 12 skeletons were found at the base of the staircase. The skeletons were inserted when the staircase began to collapse, and among the suggestions for the purpose of the tower are, one, that the tower and the wall served for flood protection, and second, that the entire installation had a cultic function, as its construction and use appear to have been a community effort. And so excavations on pre-pottery Neolithic 8 sites in Syria have also uncovered evidence of communal structures. At the site of Jerf el Amar on the upper Euphrates River in Syria, the excavators found that although the pre-pottery Neolithic A houses appear to be located somewhat randomly across the site, there is a sense of community planning as well. And so we can see views of the site at Jeff El Amar, showing houses surrounded by a central circular structure. And again, this is a pre-pottery Neolithic A site on the upper Euphrates River in Syria, with the remains of communal structures. So... Uh, so, so we see uh, houses grouped around larger buildings that are built into the ground. Uh, the excavators suggest that these buildings played a communal role in the small early Neolithic village at Jerf El Amar. In one case, the skeleton of an individual lying splayed on his back with his head removed was found in the central chamber of one of these larger buildings. And soon after this person died, the building was destroyed and then burnt. The discoveries that Jericho and Jerf El Amar indicate that the organization of pre-pottery Neolithic A society allowed for the community to act as a group. It is intriguing, however, that much of the evidence of community-level activity is found in structures with ritual functions that are associated with evidence of violence. And so we are left to question the role that ritual and violence played in knitting these early communities together. And so during the pre-pottery Neolithic B period, there was a shift from roundhouses to rectangular ones. And of course, these structures, although surrounded by rituals and sacrifice, probably violence as well. But nevertheless, in pre-pottery Neolithic B, there was a shift from roundhouses to rectangular ones, and the size of settlements increased significantly. The shift to rectangular houses allowed sites to be more densely packed than they had been in the pre-pottery Neolithic A. The villages of the pre-pottery Neolithic B are quite large and often show a high degree of planning. And so we see the shift from uh, houses that are round to houses that are rectangle. Activators estimate that in the early Neolithic levels of Abu Horeira, there were up to 1440 houses with population of about 5,000 people. As seen, uh, the houses in the areas excavated were closely packed together and that had a rectangular orientation. There is no evidence that the site was protected by a defensive wall. So estimates for the size of Abu Huraya or Horeya place it at the high end of the early Neolithic sites in the Middle East. However, sites that could have easily housed hundreds or even thousands of people are extremely common. Excavations at the site of Badja in southern Jordan have shown that houses during the latter part of the early Neolithic were two or even three stories high. At Badja, the size of the settlement was limited by its rather precarious setting on cliffs above a deep above a deep gully, and so it appears that people responded to this limitation by crowding their houses closely together and building upward. And so why people chose to live in such an inaccessible setting is a very intriguing question. During the pre-pottery Neolithic B, people lived in dense villages where their social life and interconnections 
were constrained within a grid of houses. Life in these villages also required institutional structures in order to maintain social order. Hunter-gatherer societies, which are highly mobile, can resolve disputes simply by breaking into smaller groups. The people living in villages, like Abu Horeya, would not have had this option, however. Moreover, life in a densely packed village would have led to inevitable tensions over issues of inheritance and property rights, and discovering how early Neolithic societies resolved these conflicts is a very challenging archaeological problem, but one that is essential to resolve. It is somewhat surprising that there is no real evidence for a social hierarchy in early Neolithic villages. Of course, most houses look more or less the same, as do most burials, and there is no sense that the regular layout of the sites reflects the decisions of a central authority. Concerning the rituals, which are really important, we have hidden rituals. We have display rituals. Uh, we have rituals of daily life. Um, and so uh, many uh, archaeologists have eloquently called the early Neolithic period the birth of the gods, and a stag staggering array of symbolic artifacts has been found on the early Neolithic sites. Uh, ritual objects appear to have operated at many levels, including everyday household objects and objects of display found in sacred precincts or temples. And within both houses and temples, there was also a domain of bodies and objects built into walls and buried under floors. It seems clear that as they walked the streets of their villages, the people negotiated not only a world of constructed architecture, but also a world charged with deities, both visible and hidden. The archaeological evidence for early Neolithic ritual activity can be broken down into three broad categories. Uh, hidden, displayed, and daily life. Uh, hidden rituals, uh, many of the ritual objects found in early Neolithic sites are hidden away in pits or under floors. The most striking hidden objects are plastered skulls. Plastered skulls or human skulls on which a plaster face has been modeled, found buried beneath floors on sites dating to the pre-pottery Neolithic B period. The removal of skulls from human skeletons is found as far back as the Natufian. On pre-pottery Neolithic B sites, excavators have discovered skulls on which a plaster face has been modeled. Both plastered and unplastered skulls are found below the floors of houses or in very small crevices. An analysis of one of the skulls from the site of Kafar Harish has provided a particularly detailed picture of the process of creating a plastered skull. And in most cases, the mandible or jawbone was removed before the face was modeled. But the first stage was to plug up the recesses in the skull, including the eye sockets and nasal passages. The face was then modeled onto the skull, but the position of the features was adjusted upward. And thus the eyes were built up on the forehead, the nose over the eye sockets, and the mouth over the nasal passages. A result of this is that the faces of the plastered skulls have an oddly shortened appearance. The analysis of the Kafar Ha Horesh skull was known or shown that the process of modeling a plaster skull took place in several stages and included a range of types of plaster as well as other materials as well. The careful stratigraphic analysis has indicated that in some cases plastered skulls were removed from their hiding places below the floors of houses and then carefully redeposited. Some archaeologists argued that this practice was an aspect of ancestor worship, and that it was through reverence for the ancestor that early Neolithic societies maintained cohesion. At Kafar Hahuresh, much of the excavated area is taken up by a dense deposit of human skeletal remains, hardly consistent with a normal habitation site. The excavator of Kafar Hahuresh has argued that it was a ritual site serving to bring together various communities in the region. And at the site of Ain Ghazal, for example, in Jordan, a collection of plaster figures, one of which was discovered in two pits, how these figures relate to the pre-pottery Neolithic B plastered skulls is an enigma. Another puzzling site is a small cave known as Nahal Hamar, located in remote region south of the Dead Sea. In this cave, a wide range of artifacts was found such as beads, bone tools, and arrowheads, and due to the dry conditions, textiles, including the remains of a cap and a bag, were recovered, along with a painted stone mask and a skull. The face of the skull was not decorated, but a new net pattern had been applied to the cranium. 
what the function of this collection of artifacts was, and perhaps more importantly, how they got to where they were found, are two questions that remain difficult to answer. At the site of Badja in southern Jordan, the excavator was found has found a series of unused axes that are carefully hidden within the walls of a house. The excavator suggests that these beautifully crafted hidden objects would have had a magical function. And so we've talked about uh, hidden rituals. Uh, next, we're going to talk about display rituals, and then we'll talk about rituals of daily life. Um, and then we'll be done uh, with the uh, Neolithic period. And then we'll go to the uh, late Neolithic period. But right now we're talking about the early Neolithic period. And we're talking about display rituals. The pre-pottery Neolithic A Tower of Jericho and the central structure at Jerf el Amar were meant to not to be seen. Were meant to be seen. Uh, it seems quite likely that regarding regardless of their practical functions, these structures also stood as visible symbols of the community. During the pre-pottery Neolithic B, visibly special buildings are found on a number of sites. At the site of Globeke Tepe on the Euphrates River in eastern Turkey, a series of buildings has been found built around monumental T-shaped or capital T-shaped pillars quarried as a single block from the bedrock. Some of these pillars are carved with either human or animal figures. At the nearby site of Navali Kuri, a series of large stone sculptures has been uncovered that includes depictions of humans, birds, snakes, and birds combined with humans. Most of these sculptures come from a st structure identified as a temple. The faunal remains from Globeke Tepe are dominated by gazelle, which appear to have been hunted in the midsummer to autumn. An isotope analysis suggests that this is a period of the year when large herds of migratory gazelle passed through the area. This is also a time of the year when plant foods such as wild pistachios and almonds were available in large quantity in the area around the site, and thus the monumental architecture at Globeke Tepe might be linked with seasonal gatherings of people drawn by the rich resources available in this area during the midsummer to autumn, such as the gazelle and the uh, almonds and pistachios. So, uh, we will also talk about the majority of the display items found in the pre-pottery Neolithic B, uh, which would not have been visible from any great distance. And they are thus quite different from the Jericho Tower. Many authors have argued that the context for display in the pre-pottery Neolithic B was within temples or sacred precincts. This is a very pertinent point because it suggests that access to visible signs of divinity was controlled. Perhaps the elite of early Neolithic society was a ritual elite. And in some cases, um, there is evidence for the display of skulls, objects that are normally found in hidden contexts. Uh, at the site of Kayanu in eastern Turkey, the remains of 450 individuals have been recovered from a single structure known as the Skull Room, mostly from pits. However, 49 burnt skulls were also found in contexts that suggest they fell off shelves when the building was burnt. And then we have rituals of daily life. On several early Neolithic sites, a large number of simple clay figurines have been found. And although some archaeologists suggest that the uh, statuettes were children's toys, it appears more likely that they had symbolic meaning as well. These objects are usually found distributed among houses together with domestic debris. Uh, and one of the um, massive T-shaped pillars from the site at Globeke Tepe um, is uh, depicted as some animals uh, with humans uh, with the heads of birds. Um, Uh, concerning domestication at this time in the early Neolithic period, uh, we have excavations at the pre-pottery Neolithic A site of Nativ Hagdud, recovered, uh, which we have spoken about, that recovered the remains of barley with a tough uh, ratchis, which is the part of the plant that holds the seed to the stalk. And so the ratchis is the part of the cereal plant that holds the seed to the stalk and keeps the seed on the plant until it is harvested. In wild grains, the rachis is brittle and shatters easily, allowing seeds to disperse. For agriculturalists 
it is a desirable thing to have a plant with a tough ratchet so that the seeds remain on the plant until it is harvested. A plant with a tough ratchet is truly domesticated in that it depends on human intervention for successful reproduction. Um, although the discovery at Nativ Hagdud was interpreted as the first evidence of domesticated plants in the pre-pottery Neolithic A, it now appears that this conclusion is not warranted. Within wild populations of barley, a small percentage of plants have a tough ratchet. So the small number of remains of apparently domesticated barley are found at Nativ Hagdud and could have been collected from wild stands along with a wide range of wild plants. Uh, considering the harvesting of grains, it did not take place during the pre-pottery pottery Neolithic A, as is attested by botanical remains, grinding stones, and sickles. However, it does not appear that these plants were farmed. The wild forms of plants, including wheat and barley, were harvested, but there is no indication that seeds were stored and planted. In accordance with the criterion developed, uh, cereals exploited during the pre-pottery Neolithic A were not domesticated as the plants did not depend on their relationship with humans for protection or reproduction. There is no evidence of domesticated animals other than dogs during the pre-pottery Neolithic A. Gazelles remained the main species that were hunted, together with a wide range of other animals, including fish and birds. A series of dried figs recovered from the pre-pottery Neolithic A site of Gilgal, located in the Jordan Valley near Nativ Hagdud, provides the earliest compelling evidence of plant domestication in the Middle East. These figs, like modern domesticated ones, are not capable of reproduction without human intervention. And although this intervention is simple, involving merely the cutting and planting of branches, it clearly meets the definition of domestication. And so we're talking about domesticated cereals, such as wheat and barley, which develop a, a tough ratchet that holds seeds to the plant until thre uh, threshing after harvest. While the cereals have a brittle ratchet that allows for easily dispersal, of the seeds. And so we're talking about farming as well. Farming developed across the Middle East during the pre-pottery Neolithic B. A wide range of domesticated crops are found, including cereals, uh, wheat, einkorn wheat, barley, uh, lentil and pea, uh, legumes like bitter vetch and chickpea. Uh, the domesticated grains show a decrease in the size of individual grains and they shift to a tough ratchet. A large number of grinding stones are found on pre-pottery Neolithic B sites and they give a clear indication of the important role of grains in the diet during this period. Animal domestication developed somewhat later than plant domestication. The latter part of the pre-pottery Neolithic B shows evidence of the domestication of sheeps and sheep and goats. The sheep were domesticated in the northern mountainous regions of Turkey, Iraq, or Iran, their natural habitation zone. Just establishing the location and timing for the domestication of goats, however, is quite complex, as wild goats are found across the entire region of the Middle East. But by the end of the pre-pottery Neolithic B in the early Neolithic, pigs and cattle were domesticated. The evidence for domesticated animals in this phase includes a reduction in animal sizes, an overrepresentation of the bones of young males, and the discovery of animals such as sheep outside of their natural range. The domestication of sheep and goats appears to have followed a fall-off in gazelle populations. And so next we will talk about the late Neolithic. Uh, so far, we have only covered uh, the pre-pottery Neolithic A and the pre-pottery Neolithic B. And again, just to stress uh, the uh, difference here between uh, the pre-pottery Neolithic A, the pre-pottery Neolithic A uh, dates between 12,000 and 10,800 years ago while the pre-pottery Neolithic B dates between that time of 10,800 years ago and 8,500 years ago. Uh, so we're saying the beginning of the pre-pottery Neolithic A, that would correspond with the end of the Younger Dryas event, while the pre-pottery Neolithic B would correspond to a period of improved climate at this time. Next, we will talk about the late Neolithic. And uh, we'll talk about the... Uh, Assessing the Neolithic Revolution, concerning technology, settlement and ritual, uh, domestication, and then we'll talk about the spread of agriculture to Europe, and um, and then we'll end up 
and sum up the evidence for agriculture at this time before we move to um, more um, sophisticated, complex um, societies in our timeline of human archaeological periods and uh, human pre world prehistory and archaeology.